observing binary systems with supermassive black holes. So those are the biggest, meanest binary black holes in the universe. Um, I'm doing this in two ways, both observing their gravitational waves and their light. So where does the story begin? It really begins with modern cosmology, which tells us that first, galaxies primarily go through mergers. Um, we know this through um, observing uh, galaxies in the universe today and now through history. Uh, we also know that almost all galaxies, if not all galaxies, contain one supermassive black hole, which is at the, at the center of the system. Um, so you can pull one of these out in cosmological history and see that a, a merger, in fact, might make a supermassive binary black hole. And we know relatively a lot about the evolution of the merging system. So we know that dynamical friction um, carries a galaxy to settle and relax on a roughly a time scale, something like 2 billion years. Um, and eventually we expect that a binary black hole becomes first prepared for the binary and then coalesces into a single black hole. We can take a closer look at what happens within a separation of something like 200 parsecs and see that the story of this separation um, it was a little more complicated for a binary black hole. So we know that dynamical friction can carry a binary black hole to a certain point. Um, at this point, really the game you want to play is taking enough angular momentum out of the system to get it to the point where it can emit enough gravitational radiation to then coalesce within something like much, much less than a Hubble time. Obviously, you don't want these to take more than Hubble time because then they'll just fall indefinitely at very large separations, never emit gravitational radiation. Um, but currently the problem, which we term the last parsec problem, is that we can't find, theoretically, you know, through uh, numerical simulations um, or other, uh, other modeling of, of binary systems at roughly parsec separations, there's no way we found to efficiently carry binary supermassive black holes into the gravitational wave, the gravitational wave regime in an efficient time scale. On the other hand, there are some systems, and maybe many systems, which could, in fact, take a very brief period of time at this point. And while they are emitting gravitational waves at something like um, where we might expect to detect them in pulsar timing, um, the axis here is time, by the way, it's cut off at the bottom. Um, at that point, they may actually be super efficient in their evolution and breeze right through uh, the gravitational wave regime where we might expect to detect them in pulsar timing, therefore changing the waveforms, changing the way we have to look at them. Um, so you can see here that I'm showing in the yellow roughly what the strain will look like um, at very large separations where we expect extended interactions with the environment. We don't see much gravitational radiation. That might take a very long time or a very short time. We don't know that yet. Um, in the pulsar timing regime, something like um, a couple of weeks to a couple of years of uh, orbital periods, the entire period, the time it spends in that period of emission is something like 10 mega years. Um, and then a very brief period where the binary system evolves as its final chirp, and then afterwards they uh, experience some kind of offset in the stream, which we term gravitational wave memory. And at that point is again detectable by pulsar timing. So a brief word on pulsar timing. Um, the idea here is that we have a binary black hole sitting in another galaxy. Earth is of course sitting in our own galaxy, as is another pulsar. As a stream um, from a binary black hole, comes across the Earth pulsar system, we're able to detect the deviations in arrival times from that pulsar, um, from that pulsar's pulses as the strain stretches and squeezes Earth um, space time at Earth and at the pulsar. So we see the difference um, in the space times between Earth and the pulsar. And that way, as the binary is evolving, it's orbiting around and around, the pulses arrive a little bit later, a little bit sooner, a little bit later. So a very simple simulated detected by the pulsar timing areas kind of like this. You see it's a, a sinusoid at a period of um, roughly half a period of the binary. So binary black holes, they emit gravitational waves roughly the same on all, all mass scales. Um, you see here that the strain that they'll emit scales with mass um, to the five thirds. This is a, it's a chirp mass um, with frequency over distance. So in other words, very nearby systems and very, very massive systems will emit very bright gravitational waves. So of course LIGO, congrats by the way to anyone in the audience who was working on LIGO, we're really, really excited that you guys have detected gravitational radiation. What we're doing is awesome. But if you take those systems and scale them up, you know, 
six to nine order of magnitudes larger. That's how big our gravitational waves are going to be. They're absolutely enormous. So, you know, we're not going to quite feel them like this poor guy is about to feel them, but we still have gravitational waves which are orders of magnitude larger because our systems are so much larger. Um, so I'm showing here the string spectrum to demonstrate the part that um, pulsar timing arrays are actually quite complementary to other gravitational wave techniques. So you can see LIGO, uh, for the uh, <coughs> Hertz frequency band, um, uh, space laser interferometry, of course, uh, the Lisa Pathfinder is now flying. Um, I don't know quite what their uh, sensitivity curve is, is about to be, but how do we put it on here when it, when it gets one? Um, and you can see that pulsar timing arrays right now seem to actually be dipping into the predictions we have for supermassive binary black holes, um, both for discrete systems and for a stochastic background summing up all of these systems. Um, and just to give you an idea, of course, LIGO can detect something like hertz to kilohertz. Um, the orbit of these are our sub-second. Um, the orbits of the supermassive binaries we want to detect are something like weeks, weeks to decades. Um, and of course, very massive, something like 10 to the 8 solar mass and higher, roughly equal mass systems. Um, so the frequency range of pulsar timing rays is something like nanohertz to micro. Now the goal of this work really is to do something called gravitational wave astrophysics. And the idea is not just detecting gravitational wave radiation and not just detecting like, magnetic emission from these systems, but using these to really study supermassive black hole binaries and their role in the shaping of galaxies. We know that supermassive black holes themselves do kind of co-evolve um, with galaxies in the universe, and we know that mergers play an important role. We also believe that binary supermassive black holes have a large part to do with the way galaxies are shaped, particularly their cores. Um, and of course, this relates to a large number of other areas of, of astrophysics, uh, nuclei, um, fueling them, looking at galaxy dynamics, um, and looking at things like gravitational recoil after the binary coalescence. So I'd like to talk a little bit first about um, the stochastic background of gravitational radiation. Um, I'm showing just here a, a graphical depiction of three types of waves we expect to detect in pulsar timing. And these are the ones that are most commonly studied. So continuous waves is when the binary is in its, its orbital phase. Um, uh, gravitational wave burst with memory might occur at the, at the coalescence event. If you add all of these up, uh, showing on the right and, and instead of the, the pulsar timing strain space, uh, this is a simulation done by Joseph uh, Simon, uh, you can see that each individual event, each individual binary system can add up to make a gravitational wave background in the stochastic background. So what's really exciting right now is that pulsar timing arrays are actually starting to cut in to the predictions we have for the gravitational wave background for supermassive black hole binaries in the universe. So again, here I'm showing the strain spectrum, the strain on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. And I'm showing you in, in points <coughs> are the best limits currently for the three different pulsar timing arrays that are remaining. European one, the UTA, Nanograph is the North American also Time Array, and the UTA is the Parks, Parks Array. The bands of color here are 68% um, um, confidence levels on simulations using various formulations of observations of merging galaxies and of black holes in the universe. Um, so the idea is that, in fact, if we believe what we have seen and then inferred about um, galaxy evolution in the universe, these are the gravitational wave backgrounds we should have seen, and therefore we might have actually expected to see gravitational radiation by this point in time from the stochastic background. But in fact, the Parks Pulsar Timing Arrays, the most recent paper, they, they currently have the best limit on this radiation, um, can rule out something like 91% of um, these various formulations. So we've gone out um, with myself and my student, Joe Simon, um, and performed a simulation of what we believe are the best observations of galaxies in the universe um, and of black hole masses in the universe, and tried to understand what it is that contributes to the variance of those strain spectra. So what, what makes them higher or lower? What, what makes them have such a broad, uh, broad distribution? Um, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of this because I want to say that you should go to Joe's talk on Friday. He's going to be giving a taper seminar that's going to go into the simulation and a lot more of it, uh, what we're doing with this in detail. Um, but just a very quick summary of our, our results. What we find 
is that, in fact, the largest contributor to the variance in predictions for gravitational wave backgrounds are, in fact, the galaxy black hole mass relation. Um, you can see that there's two, what we believe are the leading, um, this is a, a massive, uh, massive black hole to the, to the bulge, um, bulge mass relation. And you can see that here I'm showing the probability versus strain. So in other words, the bands in the previous plot were essentially showing that, you know, the 68% um, on the distribution. So the white is the total, uh, total distribution. The two different formulations for um, mm balls relations were are the red and the yellow. Now just to remind you what an mm balls relation looks like, I'm showing here uh, one from Pamela and Ma in 2013. Um, so you can see the central black hole mass is correlated with the galaxy bulge mass. Um, and that's, that's how it's formulated. So you have a, a slope and an intercept, um, beta and alpha, and then an intrinsic scatter. That's the one. And what we were actually able to do is because the really winning contributor to the variance in the strain spectrum was this relation. In particular, the um, parameters alpha and epsilon, those were the two variance properties which really contributed to the most in terms of how scattered that, um, the predictions for strain were. We're actually able to translate this to a region ruled out by the non-detection of gravitational waves with pulsar timing. So this is really fantastic because it's a really nice example of how we can um, constrain evolution in the universe with pulsar timing arrays. So we're able to put almost directly, you know, bar our assumptions, a limit on alpha and epsilon um, for the, the strain for the relation between the black holes and their, their host galaxies. And again, see Joe's paper talk later this week. He's going to go into a lot more detail about this really exciting simulation. More than we're doing. So, what does this mean? Why? I mean, obviously these are empirical measurements. We've done a simulation, and I love it when theorists say, well, obviously the observations are wrong. In this case, we don't think the observations are wrong, but in fact, we think now that our assumptions going into the simulation were wrong. So until now, many simulations, and most of them, have assumed that when a binary enters the pulsar timing array band, um, the system is purely gravitational wave driven. So in other words, we've ideally solved the last parsec problem. We've given it just enough oomph to get into the pulsar timing band, but once it gets there, it just uses gravitational radiation, has no interaction with the environment. Obviously, this is highly, highly idealized, but until now, we really had no reason to deviate from this simple assumption. So now what we see is that, in fact, what must be occurring, because we put really strong limits um, in this space, is that either this, um, this, this region never really happens, so the last parsec problem is, is, is a real problem, or the gas and stars and interactions with the binary actually accelerate the evolution, so then lowering the strain spectrum as we would expect. And just to show you how this might look, I'm showing you here, again, a gravitational wave driven in spiral, something like a frequency to the minus two thirds in strain space. Um, with Timing area limit. If you had stalling, so if you had a lot of problem at the last parsec problem, um, and a lot of systems not entering the gravitational wave band, it's possible that this could actually drop to arbitrarily low, um, low values. But in fact, what could also happen is if you really had an accelerated evolution and strong environmental coupling through, for instance, extended stellar interactions a lot of gas driven on into a certain binary disk, which again couples to the binary and then drives it in. Um, if you have a lot of eccentric systems, you might actually have a low frequency turnover in the spectrum. Um, and just to take something that's not a cartoon, and it'll maybe a little bit less pretty, but real data, um, this is a simulation where somebody has taken one of these, um, uh, these gravitational wave-driven simulations and actually applied other methods to it. So looking at uh, eccentric systems, and are influenced by stars, and you see this little frequency turnover. Um, and again, in the green, you're seeing how gas might influence a binary system at a low frequency. Um, so this is a simulation by the on. But at this point, the problem is, we really don't know which one of these is influencing um, our spectrum. All we have at this point is a limit. We don't have a measurement. At the point that we do get a measurement, but at that point, we'll really just have one point on this curve. We won't get a spectrum. 
maybe years in the future, after pulsar time arrays have made a first measurement, we'll make another and be able to fit a spectrum um, to this gravitational radiation. And then be able to infer what's happening here. But I would argue that, in fact, what we really need to move beyond this point, you know, to move beyond is the stalling versus is the superresolution resolution, is actually looking for binary black holes in um, these late stages of evolution using light and watching their evolution, understanding how much they're interacting with the environment, understanding whether, in fact, we do see a lot of binary black holes at that late stage of evolution. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about searches um, for individual systems, so not individual black holes, but <coughs> say, discrete binary systems um, in both continuous waves and at their coalescence events and afterwards. So the idea here is that, of course, light and gravity give completely different stories when you look at them. Gravity, when you're looking at gravitational waves, um, you're looking at accelerations and collisions, collapses and spins, um, anything that changes the dynamics of a, of a binary black hole. With light, when you see the light, you're actually looking at things like plasma, gas, the environment, magnetic fields going on around, around those black holes that might be causing jets. Um, and what's fun is that, of course, binary black holes form in mergers, and what mergers are great at doing is funneling gas onto black holes. So if those black holes are able to ignite as, as active black nuclei, you might get ionization from them, in which case you get emission lines, at which point you can track velocities as they move, if they move along your line of sight, you might get double peak emission lines, or offset emission lines from the host galaxy, be exciting, you might get periodicity because they're moving around periodically in um, <coughs> uh, the plasma. And there's a number of emissions you might expect to detect um, from, a, from a binary black hole in a merger. I just wanted to show this system, which I'm always really excited about, even though it happened more than a decade ago. This was really, I think, the first multi-messenger astronomy, maybe that was done ever, apart from uh, the original gravitational uh, inference, I would say. Um, from pulsar timing. So this is a system called QC66B, and what happened was somebody took the VLDA and observed a source, a radio, a radio blob, which essentially moved around in the list. Um, they observed this at two different frequencies, and of course you'll see that the period they fit with one fantastic orbit was approximately a year. Now the, the binary that they were able to infer in the system was something like 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10 solar masses. And a quick follow-up paper by Pulsar Timing Arrays, in fact, said, now look, you know, if we have a binary sitting this close, this is a redshift of something like 0 0.01 or 0 0.02, and that massive, we would have seen a pretty bright gravitational wave signal from this system. You can see here the induced um, pulsar timing data that you would have seen. Of course, what we actually saw was a whole lot of nice white noise. Um, but what, what they were able to do was, in fact, rule out the parameters of this binary system. This is really the first example of um, multi-messenger astronomy. Um, since then, there have been a number of systems which have been put forward in the literature to be binary systems. <coughs> um, not yet quite strong enough uh, to the pulsar timing, so I'll talk a little about that now. So what I'm showing here is the horizon of pulsar timing array experiments. Um, so this is the most recent limit for nanograv. So in other words, of course, scaled by um, mass and frequency, which the binary is at, and again, that's chirp mass. Um, so this, this map is assuming a you know, one-year binary at um, a mass of 10 to the 9 solar mass, an equal mass pair. And you can see that we can see something out to like 45 megaparsecs um, at our most sensitive point in the sky. But for most of the sky, we're only sensitive to about 10 megaparsecs. Um, you can look at another pulsar timing array. They're looking at different pulsars on the sky. So they have a different sky sensitivity. Um, this is the Parkes Pulsar timing array from a couple years ago. Um, they can go out to something like 65 or 70 megaparsecs. So you can map this to something like the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey, which is a little bit arbitrary because, of course, this contains not all binaries and not all uh, very, very massive systems. But just to give you an idea of the number of systems we're encompassing in terms of just the number of galaxies. So back in 2010, uh, pulsar timing arrays put a limit, which was maybe you know, 10 or 20 megaparsecs. In 2015, just in the past year, we've really pushed out that boundary, and we're now pushing along the lines of you know, 65 to 70 megaparsecs distant. 
way off in the future, we expect to have a square kilometer array online doing really fantastic pulsar timing, giving us really wonderful sensitivity. We really get a lot of galaxies in this field, giving us a high probability of detecting an actual multi messenger system. So there's really been some critical advances in the past few years on the observational side in terms of electromagnetics as well. So first, there's been a huge data deluge. And this is because telescopes are getting both um, more sensitivity and more survey speed, so wider fields of view, um, and more dedicated time on the sky. And these have turned up a ton of candidate binary supermassive black holes. And I'm putting candidates in italics because, in fact, the number of binary supermassive black holes, which are truly binaries that we know, are kind of like 1 plus or minus 1, right? It's approximately 0. Um, there's been none that are really convincingly shown to actually be a binary black hole. Um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has done some really fantastic work in identifying peculiar emission lines, so these things with double peaks, where they think they might be tracking the, um, the ionization from a 2 AGN moving around. Um, Pan's Towers and the Catalina Sky Survey have now started to turn up a couple of periodic sources um, in the past couple of years. And a number of miscellaneous, just morphological studies um, and other um, flux, flux tracking studies turned up something like tens of candidates. But the other thing we've really advanced in, in the past couple of years is the theory about what we expect to see from binary supermassive black holes. So I'm showing here um, the details of each of these things are not important. Uh, but just to, just to give you an idea, again, I'm showing the early stages of the binary separation, going right down to coalescence um, on the right side of the screen, where you get that little chirp at the end. Um, and the blue band there is where we expect to see these systems with pulsar timing, and then maybe later on with something like Lisa or Lisa. In the space space gravitational wave and the gravitational experiment. So on the top, you can see that we can look at two things. The ongoing merger indicators, so the large scale indicators that in fact there has been a recent merger, implying that perhaps there's still a binary in the system. Um, but when you consider things that actually trace the black holes themselves, so things like active black nuclei, or stars interacting with the binary system getting disrupted in the case of um, mass tidal disruption events, you can see that there's a number of, um, of signatures we might expect to see, which actually can track a binary through the gravitational wave regime, which implies, in fact, that it could be a multi messenger source. So the red things here are things which have either been observed and not confirmed as a binary black hole, or which have been theorized and not yet observed as a binary black hole. Um, and you can see that, in fact, there's one dual active radio nuclei. This is where you're actually resolving two radio cores, and I'll talk more about this in a moment. But that does actually go right down into at least the largest separation you might expect to see from continuous waves and pulsar time areas. And I'm showing here, I was, uh, on a couple slides ago, I was saying there's a number of candidates showing up. So if you take those candidates and try to infer their orbital parameters, you can try to put them on a map of strain space of the general region where they might lie. So of course, for each of these surveys, they all might lie way at the bottom, which makes them not really exciting. But some of them might lay a little bit more towards the top, in which case you might expect to see one or two of them as a multi-messenger source. Um, so the point just to show is that, in fact, we do see systems from surveys which could be multi-messenger sources. Um, a number of these are just individual targets, some of those are actually a group of sources in the survey. So you can overlay on this the continuous wave limits, which pulse our time areas have, have placed. So strain limit as a function of frequency. And you can see back in 2010, we weren't really getting into anywhere interesting quite yet. Nanogram a couple years ago had started to access some of the, the most nearby and brightest binaries we might expect to see. Um, there's another limit coming around I hope this year, um, maybe at the beginning of next year, um, either from the International Time Array or from Nanogram, which is going to be somewhere along the line of that, that dotted line. Um, and you can see that, in fact, Plus our timing arrays are starting to assess these surveys. Um, and again, this square kilometer array, this blue line, you know, depending on who gives this talk, it's up and down, left and right, but it's going to be very, very sensitive. I can assure you that. And then for most formulations of what we expect, realistic predictions for how sensitive pulsar timing arrays will be in the next you know, 15, 20 years, we will start to access the system which are fairly well constrained um, by electromagnetic energy. So I mentioned that radio AGN are fantastic ways to discover binary black holes. And nature has really given us a fantastic 
way to do this because what you're able to do, I'm showing here uh, Cygnus A, it's a, one of the best looking radio galaxy in the sky, which is why I'm showing it. Um, you can see down at the center you have a black hole with an accretion disk. Um, magnetic fields are collim um, collimating a, an outflow of plasma, which is a, a relativistic jet. And the radio core that you're seeing there is thought to be just a, a standing shock wave near the base of that jet. So something that relatively closely tracks the black hole. What's really nice is that, in fact, when you look at radio emission from a radio galaxy, um, we know from just looking at the synchrotron spectrum, and of course all this, all this emission is synchrotron, that the diffuse radio emission has a relatively steep spectrum, something like minus 0.7 to minus 1. Um, if you look at the, the index of that emission model. On the other hand, if you look at the core, a very compact region, you might expect to get self-absorption effects. So you might get a flat, a flat spectrum in the core. And what's really good about this is, of course, this gives you a way to morphologically identify the cores of galaxies and find that there is, in fact, a supermassive black hole there. Um, and one of the more famous, I wouldn't say binary, but a dual active black nuclei that we, we know of, um, and I would say this is the, the smallest, most confident uh, pair that we know of. Uh, you can see this is a, a spectral index map, so again, mapping the, the slope of that, that radio spectrum. You can see that the two cores there actually have very flat radio spectra. So we believe that those are, in fact, two supermassive black holes sitting at about projected separation of seven parsecs. On the larger scales, you have some kind of relativistic outflows um, that are more diffuse. Now what's really exciting about radio emission is that you can, you can really probe huge ranges in scale, so orders of magnitude. So if you have a, you know, a merging galactic system, it's really messy, even on kiloparsec scales, you really can't probe that as possible. With something like the VLA, you could go and look for dual AGN and look at something like our spark second star planet scales um, and find if they're separated that, that widely, you could find a pair at something like 100 to 100 parsecs to uh, 10 kiloparsecs. If you look with the very long baseline array, there are things like Emerlin and the EDM. These things are telescopes which are spaced across the continent of the US, or in, you know, in the case of the EDM, central the world. Of course, some space based interferometry actually has a um, sitting out in space, so you get really long baselines and really incredible resolution. So you can actually track and discover morphologically a binary down to something like 0.01 parsecs. So it's a well below um, parsec separation where you might expect that these interactions might be happening. Um, on the other hand, pulsar time arrays can probe down to very, 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 very small separations. Um, and to some extent, for the most nearby and most massive systems at wider orbits, you could actually expect to probe systems with both pulsar time arrays and a very long baseline array. So that takes a pretty rare system and a pretty ideal um, separation and mass. So how do we find those systems? Um, I won't go into detail about all the campaigns we're doing um, because we've now begun a huge range of surveys, um, surveys and largely with radio, but also with some help from Hubble and other um, optical telescopes. So a huge, huge number of hours at radio facilities to actually target systems which we believe contain a binary black hole based on of these other secondary indicators like peculiar emission lines um, and other things. And this is really enabled by the fact that the VLA and the LBA have just undergone a really fantastic upgrade given its wider bandwidth, really high sensitivity. And so instead of you know, the 800 hours it takes now to do this type of survey, you know, back 10 years ago this would have basically been impossible. It would have taken years of data to, um, to collect enough sensitivity to expect to see two supermassive black holes in the system. So the goals of this research are to, of course, discover multi-messenger targets. Um, one of the main ideas of this research is to characterize those things, um, those indicators which we aren't sure might indicate a binary. So particular emission lines might, in fact, come from an unstable accretion disk, for instance, instead of an actual dual AGM going around. Um, but if, in fact, we can confirm that it's a binary with something like the LBA, you can see two um, the cores and possibly see them moving, that would be you know, an obvious, obvious tie, and I'm really excited. And I'm just doing simple population studies of, of binary black holes. Um, this is an important aspect of this research. So observations are ongoing for this, um, but I wanted to talk about one source, which I think is really exciting, 
Um, so these are the three sort of regions of the space that we, we started on in terms of uh, searching for binary black holes. And so something to talk about lies in this sample, where in fact we have a large number of um, galaxies with a single core, but on the large scale we have a lot of tidal interactions. So we see um, large scale features that in fact the major merger happened maybe not that long ago. In enough time, enough time, enough recently that uh, you would still see signs that it hasn't yet relaxed. Um, so sufficiently relaxed that you see the two cores together, but not so much that it's um, settled down into a really cool galaxy. So for this example, we've got 35 major massive mergers. Um, we know the major mergers and very massive mergers um, because of the um, color identifications of these galaxies, <coughs> or other indicators. Um, this sample comes from Carpinetti at all. So again, we want to look for the most nearby systems and the most massive. So this sample was chosen because first we believe they might contain a binary. There's only one core, so we know that the two black holes probably aren't separated um, more than you know, the extent of that core. We know that they're massive, and we know that they're very nearby because we have redshift information. So I'm showing here one system that we've looked at. And I'm showing overlaid on the left uh, the uh, very large array image, um, plus optimal, very large arrays and contours there. And this is just to give you the sense that, in fact, there is really only one radio source there. It's just sitting right in the center of that galaxy. And I love the VLBA because it's so good that you can probably see the emission in the right image. But in fact, there's a radio contour overlaid on that right image. It's in green. You guys can spot that. But you can see here that, in fact, the radio emission in this galaxy is incredibly compact. But if you zoom in right to the center of this galaxy, you can see that, in fact, we do see two radio uh, features in the center of the system. Now, of course, look at this as I did. I got really excited. Huh, it's great. But in fact, when you look at the spectra of these two radio features, they're quite steep. These don't look like sort of compact features you would expect to see at these frequencies um, as a flat spectrum emission with this uh, synchrotron self absorbed. So in fact, what we believe is happening in the system is that sitting right at the center of this galaxy is a very, very small version of the center of something like same to say. Um, so this is a concept that we call a compact steep spectrum object. And the idea is, of course, that Cygnus A hasn't always been the big monster that it is. It started off as a young radio galaxy, very small, and eventually, over many, many, many years, expanded to a large radio galaxy. So you can try to understand dynamically, we believe these jets are relativistic, this is really well founded for um, radio jet modeling. And if you say that, in fact, these are relativistic jets, you can approximate an age for this uh, radio source. But of course, that age depends on what angle you're seeing the jet. So if you have a to your line of sight, it could be very young because it's not very broad, it's only something like 20 parsecs across. At which point, the jet age is something like 70 years. So something ignited this jet 70 years ago. But then if you give it a larger angle of incidence, which could be very possible, this could well, asymptotically go up to very, very large, but something like maybe 10 kilo years. But what's really exciting about the system is that we believe that something in the past 10 kilo years turned on this radio jet. So what do we know about the system? First, we know that it seems to have undergone a major murder in the past, something like maybe a billion years. Um, we still see large tidal features, so it hasn't quite settled down yet. We do only see one black hole system here, and it's sitting right at the center of this galaxy. So something has driven it just to the core of the galaxy, and then turned on this radio jet. So this is exciting for a couple of reasons. Again, one black hole at the center of a merging galaxy. If this black hole has already coalesced, this gives us a good indicator that, in fact, that coalescence happened very rapidly. There was nothing that held it up at parsec separations. And in fact, it, it was able to evolve through the gravitational wave regime and coalesce in a, in a reasonable time scale. Secondly, we can try to actually estimate very, very roughly the parameters of the binary based on what we think that merger might have, um, might have entailed. So again, from the modeling from Carpinetti, um, we can actually place an approximation for the, um, the mass of the black holes. 
um, approximately the, uh, the mass ratio, and then get roughly the binary parameters. And not only that, but actually the time of murder. So if we if we assume that in fact this black hole coalesced, perhaps it had an accretion disk, a certain binary accretion disk, which was driving its evolution. Um, there are theories that, that tell you exactly what happens after a binary coalescence, which is that there is a bit of time, and then the um, certain binary disk falls in, and then ignites a radio jet. So this is our, our current working model for the system, that in fact a merger occurred, certain binary disk fell in, and turned on this um, compact C spectrum source. So this is really exciting, because we can actually date this merger. And we might think, well, couldn't we detect this with pulsar time areas? Wouldn't that be great? We say, well, of course, that happened in the past. It happened 70 to 10,000 years ago. Why is this important? But in fact, pulsar time arrays can, in a way, look into the past. So this gravitational wave front presumably happened um, maybe roughly at the time of the, um, the coalescence. So the gravitational wave front, of course, happened at the time of the coalescence. Um, the light that we're seeing from it, um, so the inference of something like 70 to 10,000 years ago, is traveling at the same speed as that gravitational wave front. Um, so they arrive roughly at the same time ever. But in fact, this wave front hits the pulsar that we're timing, and many other pulsars that we're timing, at different times, and then we are able to see the wave front from that pulse train at a time in the past, which is delta t, um, which is just simply the path length from the, um, the source to the pulsar to the Earth. So this actually gives us a look into the past, where, in fact, if the binary coalesced 70 years ago, and delta t is 70 years, we might actually expect to see the gravitational wave signal, uh, gravitational wave signal from that pulsar, from that binary, in one pulsar. And of course, it only matters if this thing is bright enough. But in fact, using the binary parameters, we can show that the strain for this thing, and again, this is an upper limit because we don't have to handle the binary parameters, but it could be very bright. One by ten to the minus thirteen is I'm sure it's very enormous. Um, I think our limits are something like an order of magnitude less than this. So even with a little bit looser um, binary parameters, we might still expect to detect this signal if delta t is aligned correctly. So this is fantastic because it looks like potentially this could be a multi-messenger target. Uh, and what's neat is that you can actually map out the delta t's for the pulsars in the International Pulsar Timing Array and say that if they are um, able to detect the system, we could actually measure the jet angle for this, this outflow. No be Perhaps not the most important measurement in the world, but it's a multi measurement measurement, and it would be really exciting in, in that regard. Uh, be able to model the system and model uh, the dynamics of that radio jet. And of course, what's also kind of fun is that if there are any people who think the pulsar in the audience, if you want to find a pulsar in just the right position to like map out the space, that would be great. Map out the whole, the whole jet edge angle relation. Um, so a couple of takeaway points just from observing the systems of light. Um, electromagnetic emission now has really fantastic potential to look for multi-messenger sources. Um, there's a ton of theory out there. There's a number of ongoing surveys, both mine and others, um, are doing um, to discover binary black holes. We believe we've seen a super efficient black hole binary in spiral. This is a sample of one, so don't extrapolate too much. Um, but of course, it is showing that, in fact, at least one system is able to get past the last parasite problem. And of course, this is an possible, possible multi-messenger burst target, which would be really exciting for pulsar time areas. Now, what's next? So first, I wanted to highlight some work which was done by um, a group of postdocs and uh, senior researchers here. Um, and this is looking at the detection probability versus time for the stochastic background of pulsar time areas. Um, so you can see four different um, timing arrays, so PBTA, Nanograv, um, the European one, and this is the IPTA, the International Pulsar Timing Array, where all of us are getting together and combining our pulsar timing array data looking to the future. So what they've done here is try to understand, even if we had a lot of issues with stalling or super efficient evolution um, and other issues with noise in our pulsars, what's the time to detection um, that we expect for pulsar timing arrays? This is again for the stochastic background. And you can see that even in a fairly pessimistic scenario, we're going to detect the background within something like 10 years. 
So that's going to be really exciting. And of course, the better constraints we have on, um, on the black hole uh, binary population, the lower magnetic position, the better we'll constrain other parameters of binary evolution in the universe with this first time. Of course, multi messenger studies, looking at actual binary systems. Um, so we've done now a lot of work to uncover potential binary systems <coughs> with um, electromagnetic means. What the next step is now is to take pulsar timing array data and look at those systems and try to do studies like I showed you before with UC66B. And basically set constraints on what binaries can be, um, can be existing in those systems based on the lack of detection of gravitational waves. Or, you know, if we detect gravitational waves, we'll find that too. Of course, there's another, you know, tens to twenties of um, targets awaiting exploration. Um, I'm just showing here some, some highlights from the literature in the past few years. Um, one of the, the most famous binary systems is OJ287. You can see that in the upper right. It's really cool because they have data like, dating back to the 1800s. And you can see a, a periodic flare coming out of this thing every something like 12 years. It's pretty exact. Um, so people are modeling this to look for binary evolution as, as a binary system. Um, you can see other things like velocity oscillations. That's the see portable 51. Um, and here I'm showing a radio jet, which is um, having a helical jet coming out, so presumably processing, perhaps due to a, another black hole around it. So again, you know, a number of systems which are look very nice as potential binary candidates, but need a little bit more investigation as to what is actually going on in these systems. So by way of conclusion, I just wanted to show a nice, nice image to say that pulsar timing arrays are really doing interesting work now in constraining binary populations in the universe um, through the stochastic background. And we're also being able to now to discover potential multi-messenger sources and do really interesting studies even before we detect gravitational radiation from these systems. Um, so the limits of pulsar timing are, are really making interesting impacts. And this is the end of my talk. I think a, a new era of gravitational wave astronomy has begun, both at the very high frequency regime of LIGO, very exciting, and also even at the, the very low frequency regime with, with pulsar timing rays. Um, doing fantastic probes of galaxy evolution, black hole physics, and electromagnetic studies are really going to contribute in the coming years, partly because there's a lot of data coming in, both from electromagnetic telescopes and with new um, pulsars for the pulsar timing rays. Um, I just want to do a little advertisement because the Gravitational Wave Astrophysics Working Group from NANGRAM is meeting in room 304 all this week, um, except for Thursday, we're meeting in 370. If you guys want to drop by and discuss any of this research or any ideas you have about pulsar timing rates, just come by and chat with us. Welcome and fun. So, thank you. So, um, two comments. The first is that the, um, I think it's largely understood now that double peak emission line systems are not caused by binaries, that it's something to do with the you know, the frequent by Michael Rapius, maybe last year, so yeah. really good in that now. The other thing is that with the, uh, with the hundred or so candidates that we've had in Paulina, um, with the latest sort of uh, population statistics suggest that most of those are probably low Q for 0.01 systems. So we've got a, a big primary and other secondary which is maybe 100 for 5. And when you look at the statistics there, it seems to suggest that if those were actually sampling a gas dominated population. So which will seem to tie in with what you're seeing with that with that so you've got a lot of gas around which is maybe speaking up people which is pretty and that seems to be consistent. So there seems to be a consistent story coming out there if we believe that the cameras are actually doing it. Okay, great, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll pop along and think that we can have a story of that. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I'll plug Joe Simon's talk on Friday again too because, in fact, we've been looking at um, simulations, the population synthesis models of binary black holes and showing that, in fact, a lot of the binaries you expect aren't between two, you know, gasless ellipticals. But in fact, that many of them actually will have gas, so you have like some kind of mixed merger thing going on in most of the systems. So, yeah, that would be also consistent with that. Other questions? Yeah, okay. So, 
great talk. Um, one thing that's really struck me about sort of trying to understand what the signals are that we're looking for um, is that we find it very hard to account for stalling. So but as having looked at heaps of different ways of trying to find binaries, what do you think, I mean, how would you summarise the sort of totality of the evidence that binaries do not stall at the moment? Uh, I mean, so, well, it's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have debates with this about people sometimes, and I think there's no clear consensus that, you know, you, you say something like, well, we don't see a lot of binaries in the local galaxies. Which is maybe true, but if they're stalling, they're not going to have gas. So you won't see them. So it's a little bit of, of a hard thing to, to really pin down. Um, I think there really is no very conclusive evidence, but a lot of maybe circumstantial. We have done radio surveys to fairly small separations and not seen just like a huge pile of binary black holes. But again, you know, if they don't have any gas, they're not going to see them. So, yeah, I mean, if, if people do say that you could, in fact, in the centers of all massive galaxies globally, have a binary in the system, a system in the center separated by one parsec, which is, you know, silently sitting there looking on the large scale dynamics like a single system, because it's small enough, it's treated like a discrete. The system that you described, you know, I'm sorry if I lost a lot of things, but what's the evidence actually for major merger in that galaxy? I would talk to you about my analysis because okay. I'm not confident describing it. Okay. <laughs> um, it has to do with the color fitting of um, the galaxy. It's very red, so there's no evidence for young solar populations. Um, so presumably it was two older galaxies. I think it was also looking at similar colored and uh, sort of an evolutionary fact of all the galaxies that they looked at at the various separations leading down to these single core galaxies. And the larger separated ones, you can see that they are in fact, you know, the major. Welcome once again to the 2016 Green Lectures, this year delivered by Professor Stephen Hawking. Individual stars, but you might see it in their velocity 